So sets are like lists in many ways. They're just slightly different notation. But uh, they give you such power that once you start to use them properly, you will actually write much, much faster programs. So set is basically another Python object exactly like a list, except that sets cannot have duplicates. Right? So you can create a list. Um, you can create a list of values. Okay. In which you can repeat the same value many times. Uh, but in sets, this is not meaningful. So sets like in mathematical notation, a set doesn't have duplicates. The point of a set is that it really doesn't mean anything new if you repeat the same thing twice. A set is basically all the things that you have. What are the numbers that are in your bag that you have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? The fact that you have multiple of them is irrelevant. So if you wanted to create a set, you can simply take a list and convert it to a set. And that set is going to basically remove all duplicates. Okay, so I'm going to write down what do we know about sets? Sets, and what are they good for? All right, so one, uh, no duplicate values are stored in set. Okay, so that's kind of a lame thing, but uh, we'll, we'll see why that's important in a second. Um, but sets themselves, you cannot really um, refer to them with an index. They don't really have an index. They are like a logical concept, right? So for example, um, let's see, what's your name? Pauline. So Pauline is a student in this class, right? So this is a logical fact. So if I put a set of students, Pauline will be in it. It really doesn't matter if I say this two times, three times, it's just a fact. So as a result, it's not like you know her existence has an ordinal value. So you cannot actually index a set. So values is a set, but you cannot do indexing. Okay? You cannot really refer to the sixth value, fifth value. It's just that either a value is in the set or it is not in the set. So values are either in the set or not, but you cannot use indexing. So you can, for example, check that 1 is in values and 6 is in values. No. So you can check whether a value is in a set or not, but you cannot actually access individual elements of a set. So again, this is a simple uh, idea. So you can check whether a value is in a set or not. So you can check that one in set of one, two, three. Now, can you do the same thing for a list? Can you take a number and check if it's in a list or not? Can you check for is in a list of one, two, three, four? Yes, right? So that's a lot like lists. Four and one, two, three, four, just to make sure it is there. All right. Now, one of the things we will see is that when you use a list to do this versus a set, there is a big difference in how fast that runs. So if you have a list and you check whether a value is in the list, and if you have 10 items, then you may have to check 10 items. And if your list is now 100 items, then it's going to be 100 times slower. Whereas for a set, it will always be the same. Why that is, we will talk in detail, but not today. So it is exactly like a list when you check whether a value is in, but it is not uh, indexable like a list. And you can actually go between uh, lists and sets. 
So you can take a set and you can convert that to a list. And you can take a list, convert that to a list set. Right? So you can convert between lists and sets. Using list and set, yes. Excuse me. Yes. For not in will be true. Yes. So you will say for not in one, two, three, like this. Yep. And the same thing is true for set. Okay. Oh, sorry. That is true. Okay, let me save this here. All right, other questions? So, all right, uh, moving on. Um, so these are kind of the basic ideas of sets. But the thing that's really exciting about sets is that you can do set operations. So set operations is really going to give you a new power that you did not have. So let's look at some set operations. So sets of values you may be used to from uh, math to use a uh, Venn diagram. So you have two sets. They may or may not overlap, right? So you can find, given two sets, items that are in one set but not the other, which would be here. So this is called set difference, right? Set difference. So this is items in A, but not in B. So in Python, you would use A minus B for that. You can also find items that are in both. So what would be the uh, set operation for that? Set intersection. Okay. And you can find items that are in both A or B, right, set union. which you would write like this, okay? So let's see how that works. And then many other things are possible, so we will see some of those. So let's say one set of values is one, two, three. One set of, second set of values is four, five, six. Okay, so what are the values that are in one but not in two? The actual values? Yes? What are the values in set one but not in set two? One and two, thank you. All right. <laughs> one, two, and three. Yes, that's not what I wanted to do. That's stupid. All right. Uh, let's change this. All right, I'm going to restart this then, but that was stupid of me. Let's start again. All right, values one is set one, two, three, and values two is set three, four, five. Okay, now, now it's better. Values one minus values two will be one and two because three is in both of them. If you did the reverse, values two minus <coughs> values one is four and five. The value that is common with both of them is set intersection. And in this case, it's going to have a set of just three, right? And if you take the union, it is going to be all the values that are in one and two, but no duplication. So it's going to be 
one, two, three, four, five. So three is not repeated, but it's in both, so you will do that. And then there are other uh, more esoteric ones. So you can, for example, find the symmetric difference. So, um, so if you were doing symmetric difference, it will be something like this. So this is the symmetric difference, and it's written like this. Okay. So what would be values one, symmetric difference values two? Everything except the thing that is common, which is in this case, three. Okay. You can take a set, you can add values to it, um, but to add values to the set, you don't use a pen. Okay. This is actually kind of confusing because you can use a pen logically, but in fact, it doesn't make sense because there is no location in a set, right? The set doesn't have a beginning or an end. Append always means you append to the end. To make sure that this is buried, you know, that's burned to your brain, you cannot use append, you can use add. So you can add a new value by the add function. So to add a new value, you use add, not append. Remember, location indexing is not allowed in sets. Uh, to remove a value, okay. Now this is a little tricky because if I use remove, and the value that I'm trying to remove is not in the list, it will give me an error. So this is something you have to remember, right? The same thing is true for lists. So if I wanted to remove five, however, it will work. So you cannot remove something that is not there. But um, Python has this one function that allows you to remove something, but not cause an error if it is not there. That one is called discard. So for example, I cannot remove four because remove four is not here. <coughs> but I can discard four, even though four is not there, it doesn't give me an error. If I wanted to remove something that was already here, I can also do that with this card. This card seems to be the, um, the simpler and easier way of doing the same thing. Okay. So let's, let's write down what we just learned. So you can convert between lists and sets. You can do set operations. So you can do union by A or B. <coughs> you can do intersection with A and B. You can do set difference with A minus B. It did symmetric difference with a tilde b, which is kind of a useless thing, actually. I've never used that. Um, did we learn anything else? Then the last thing that we learned, we will lear learn, is that you can, um, so how about this? So if I have values one here, and I set x equals values 1. Is x an alias or a copy of the set? So every single container we will see, so we will see basically three main containers, lists, sets, and dictionaries. Anytime you have a container that is meant to carry a lot of data, it is always <coughs> going to be an alias. So if I were to add a value, It is, in fact, added to both. If you wanted to create a shallow copy, what you would do is you would say, make a copy of x and assign it to y. 
Now y is actually a shallow copy, meaning that I took the values in x and I copied them over. So if I were to add a value, that is only added to y but not to x. So to change the values in a set, we have, let's say, set A. I use add the value. We have removing. Remember that this will give an error if 4 is not there. Or you can do a dot discard, and this will not this will not give an error. All right. So half an hour for sets. Yes. So there is no ordering, okay? The order is not relevant. So this is something we have to get used to. Um, so the question was why the 10 is in the middle. It's not 1, 3, 10, and 12. Those of you who like order, you will not like sets because they are not ordered, okay? So in fact, what happens is that sets are actually not really uh, stored by an index. It's not that you put the 10 at the end, so the 10 is going to be the last item. What has happened is that the sets, it takes the value that it stores and it uh, uses a function to compute a hash value. Okay, so think of the hash value as some integer. So it takes every value I store. I can store um, strings and sets. I can store numbers. It takes every value and assigns it to some integer. It's a hash value. And it actually stores it at an address based on the value. Because of that, they are not ordered. But because of that, they are also very efficient. Okay? So I don't want to talk too much about complexity today, but we will see that in a minute. Um, but because of that, there is no real ordering. So you cannot take the first item, second item of a set. Any other questions about sets? Yes. No, you cannot call individual numbers from a set. So the only thing you can do is, if you wanted to iterate, you can write a for loop. So you can do the following. So you can say, for example, okay, I create a list for you. So I can say for value in set of values, print value. So it's basically like the same for loop you write for lists. But how many values will I print when I do this? I have one, two, three, four, five, and seven, right? Are they going to be in order? May or may not be. There is no guarantee. It happens that they are, but there is no guarantee. If you really wanted to have them ordered, then you actually have to sort it yourself. So there is a function that takes a set and creates a sorted list out of the values in it. So if you really were uh, trying to make sure that they are sorted, you would actually use this. So sorted basically will take a list and create, take a set, create a sorted list with the values in the set, okay? If it is not important, you don't have to, but this is not necessarily in sorted order. Anything else? Yes. No, there is no discard for uh, lists. As far as I know, there is no discard, but we do have remove, right? 
Yeah, so there is no discard, as far as I know. You can always try. No. Yes? Yep. So the intersection is the and symbol. So you can say, for example, like this, right? So Z is the, the set that is returned by the intersection of the values in both sets. So find, find the values that are in both sets, put them in a new set, so you create a new set, and then return that set. And then, you know, like everything we do, whenever you have an operation that returns a value, you can assign it to a you know, new variable, or you can print it, and so on. What else? Yes? Um, it is semi-random. So basically, whatever the hash order was. So the question was, if you take the list of a set, what is the order? There is no real order unless you want to sort it yourself. So, you know, so for example, if I have x. It's very hard sometimes when I'm trying to create a list that is not ordered to actually have that uh, not ordered. So let's try and see. It's really difficult. Um, it's very difficult to create one. But there is no real ordering, so you may or may not have it ordered. So if you wanted to order it, you have to use the sorted. So, um, so List of a set is not in any way ordered unless you use sorted of A. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, so here's what I would like to do now. Um, I was thinking that I can use sets to solve a Sudoku puzzle. Um, are you sick and tired of Sudoku? Yes. <laughs> All right, well, let me do something with IMDB then, you know, if, if you are like, but well, I'm just gonna write you an automatic prover. All right, so I'll, I'll start with IMDB first and then we can, um, we can go to Sudoku because it's a very good example. I know you hate it. All right. So um, if you really want to come along with me, but beware that this is a massive file, I put here on the resources this file called IMDB data. But this is a 65 megabytes of lots of movies with lots of actors, okay? So um, I want to illustrate to you the power of sets. Now if you want, you can download it and come along with me. And I can try to show you what that file looks like. And it, oh, it did not crash, okay. So this is a file. It is a huge file. It actually has 200,000 lines, okay? And uh, it basically uh, has lines that have huge amounts of space, but it does have name of an actor, vertical bar, name of a movie, vertical bar, and a year, okay? So this is a massive file, and it doesn't have all the newest uh, movies, because it's from an older uh, dump. But, um, you know, you actually have some movies that were in production, so you have like 2015, 2016, but that's actually kind of not representative of all the movies that came out. So we are going to write code to figure out uh, all the actors, how many different actors are there in this file, okay? So, 
I'm going to write a very simple piece of code. So, and I'm going to put this so that we get used to this. Okay. And I'm going to basically go through every single line in the uh, file, read the data, and then find the name of an actor. If you want to test it, we can at least look at the movies of a certain actor. So let's write a simple piece of code. So I am going to, okay, I'll, I'll do it in the slow way. So I am going to open imdbdata.txt for line in F. I am going to take the line, strip all the space. Whenever you use strip, remember that you are removing things from the two ends. Okay, not from the middle. If you wanted to remove information from the middle, you should use replace. Then I'm going to split on vertical bar because that's the item that uh, separates between different uh, fields, this vertical bar. Then the actor name is going to be the first item and it will also have lots of space, so I'm going to strip that again. Movie is going to the second item, and year is going to be the third item. Now, if you wanted to see if this is working correctly, you can put the little counter here. And then I need to save this in the same place as my um, file so I can actually process this. All right, today I'm having some issues with my... Uh... Okay, so this is where my file is. Now this file has like historic, very old data. So you can see some names that you really don't know anything about. So line 11, bracket, thank you. Okay, was that the thing you were trying to solve? All right, I think it is. Okay, I guess I really didn't print anything. So let's print actor and movie. Okay. Right. If you want to test something else, you can, for example, look for movies of a certain actor. So we can actually write a little program that once I read an actor, I, uh, I can find all the movies for that actor. So instead of this, I can read a name. And I'm not really going to, uh, you know, do any error processing right now. And if the name that you're looking for is the same as actor, then I'm going to print the movies of that actor. Okay. So, in the honor of yesterday, I'm going to search for Michael J. Fox. Do you know about yesterday? Yesterday was the actual day that he goes in Back to the Future. It was, in fact, yesterday, 2015, October uh, 21, was it? Yeah. So we'll search for Michael J. Fox. Okay. So these are all the movies of Michael J. Fox. As I find them one by one, I print them out. Did I need to put that in a list? If I didn't need to really sort them in any way, I can just print them out. What if I wanted to find how many different movies there are? I can actually put a little counter. And every time I find a movie, I'm going to increment my counter. 
And at the end of the loop, I'm going to print this many movies are found. Okay. Who else do we want to know? Who? Will Smith. He's still making movies? All right. All right, 25 movies. Who else? I don't think I have Jennifer Lawrence. This is kind of an old uh, thing. No, there's not bad. Only three movies. If you search for old people, then there's lots of movies by them. Um, all right, are you so far with me? So now I want to find, so this is a simple program. What I really want to find is how many different actors there are in my um, database. So I'm going to take all the names that I find, and just to illustrate to you, I'm going to put them in a list. So every time I find a new actor, I want to put it in a list, but I don't want to repeat it. You know, you may ask why I'm not using a set, but I'm trying to show you this very interesting concept called complexity. So I can do the following. I can have actors as a list, and I am going to get rid of this, and I'm going to get rid of this. So for every actor that I find, if the actor is not in actors, I am going to append this actor to this list. And then when I'm done, I am going to say how many actors are found. So let's look at this program really uh, slowly. So I do the same thing. I read every line, and then I have a list called actors. Every time I find an actor, I check if it is a new actor because I don't want to repeat the actors. And if I'm using a list, if so, I put it in the list, and then I print out. And just to show you how fast this is going, I'm also going to print as I'm adding new things to the list. So I am going to have a line counter. For every line I'm going to process, I am going to increment the line counter. And it will be very, very slow if I print how many lines I'm processing for every line. So I'm going to print it every 1,000 lines. So I'm going to print every 1,000 line, which line number I am in. Okay. This is just so that you can see how fast this program is going. Okay. Remember I told you how many lines there are in this uh, file? 200,000. 200,000 lines. So we are not playing games in this class anymore. Okay? So why not? All right? Stop it. <laughs> You know what I didn't do? I actually did not put a condition here. There we go. <laughs> you know like when you read, when you watch Hollywood movies and then they are like continuous printing stuff, like when you're doing, uh, they are doing uh, fingerprint matching and then it's like they're going to print all the uh, you know, images that's matching. It's like really stupid, why would you do that, right? That will totally slow down your program. All right, uh, as you saw. So, how is it going? 
kind of slow, yeah? 30,000? You're going to wait a while, right? Before it's 200,000? Now, why is it taking so long? Okay, so here is this principle. I have stored the actor names in a list. So I am trying to find if a given actor is actually in a list. So I am trying to search, for example, if A is in a list of B, C, D, A. Okay. So that means I need to check one by one. So I'm going to first check if A is equal to B. If not, now I'm going to check if A is equal to C. Then I'm going to check if A is equal to D. And if I'm very unlucky, the thing that I'm looking for is at the very end of the list, I'm going to check if A is equal to A. If I'm even more unlucky, then what I'm looking for is not even in the list. That means I have to check every single item, right? So I have to really check, do an if statement for every single item in my list. So that means if I have 10 things, I have to do 10 comparisons. If I have 10,000 things, then I have to do 10,000 comparisons, right? So if I have 10, more, uh, 10 times more values, I have to do 10 times more comparisons. So this is something we call linear program. Linear programs are OK, except now I am doing this for every single line of the file, which is how many? 200,000, right? So as I'm going through my list, the number of actors is increasing. And for every line, I am doing a long comparison. Now, the nice thing is that you don't have to do that with sets. Because what sets will do is it will basically allocate a space based on the value. So think about that there are shells, but shells are not addressed at 0, 1, and 2. They are addressed as take the value that is in, let's say, A, compute a uh, hash function, and then if it is 10, I'm going to store it at 10. So I don't need to check the 10,000 lines. I only need to check that one item, that if my item is there, it would be in that address. So do you think it's finished? No. Um, all right. Are you convinced that this is slow? Do you want to wait? Do you want to wait for this to finish? <laughs> I don't like this at all. So what I'm going to do is I am going to change my program. Instead of using a list, I am actually going to use a set. Okay? And then I don't even have to check when I'm adding something if the value is in that list or not. Because if it's in the list, it's not going to have a duplicate, right? All I need to do is, I don't even need an if statement. I just need to add the actor. That is all, right? I don't need to check because it's never going to duplicate values. OK. Can I stop this one now? All right. So now I'm going to run the same program, but instead of using uh, lists, I'm going to use sets. And yes, incidentally, you can use length for sets as well as lists. Was that faster? OK. It turns out that there are 120,000 actors found, so near the end, it was actually comparing each actor to 127, 120,000 actors. Instead of 120, now I'm doing only one comparison for each one. Yes? This is just the line from the file. So I wanted to see how fast my program was going, because otherwise you would have a program that's doing nothing. So I'm printing which number of line I'm printing, but I don't want to print every single line. So I'm going to print every 1,000th line. So this is why I'm using this here. Because otherwise, you know, you will be looking at a program that's doing nothing. So this is kind of a debugging hint also. If you're writing a program that has a loop, make sure that you actually write something that does anything else. All right. 
So, any questions? Are you convinced that this is actually cool? All right, so, I like you. I'm still going to do Sudoku. Uh, but, but I'm not going to do any of the stuff you did. I'm just going to write a Sudoku solver, okay? It's going to be very simple. And I'm going to basically, In fact, if you want to um, be spared uh, everything else, here, I'm going to take the print board, my, my print board function here, and put it here. Okay. So what I want to do is very simple, okay? I want to write, basically, a simple function that's going to look at the Sudoku board and see if there is a location that has only one possible value, okay? So a lot of the easy puzzles can easily be solved like this because when you go through it, every cell has only one single value. If you find the one cell that has a single possible value, then you can put that value in there and then repeat the same process, okay? So I want to go through this just because I want to show you a, how I solve this, and B, how to write kind of the function in slow steps. So the first thing that I need to do is to write a program that reads a Sudoku board, right? Okay, so let's write a simple program that reads a Sudoku board. And in fact, I'm going to give it a file name. So in this case, there is one file called easy.txt. Okay, so this is how I generally write functions. I generally say, okay, the first thing I need is to do something. So that means I need to write some program. So I'm going to just write a function for that purpose. So, so what this will do is find a cell that has only one possible item. Put the item there and continue until no such cell is left. And for some boards, this is going to be actually the real solution. Okay? So I need to write a function to read a Sudoku board. Okay? So my Sudoku board is going to be a list of lists. So I'm going to read each line. And I am going to split the line on what character? What do I split on? Space, right? And then I am going to append this to the list, and then I'm going to return for it. I'm not going to convert things to a uh, number because some items are going to be the, the dot, which is not an actual value, so it's easier everything is a string. Okay? And if you want to see if this is correct, I am going to just print the board to see. Okay? So here is what my board looks like. So it's a list of lists, and here it is. So if I wanted to actually write a program to uh, print this, okay, I can take the board, and for i in range 9, for j in range 9, Okay, so most of you are trying to do it something like this, right? This is kind of complicated for me because I need to keep track of too many different ways of spacing things. So instead, I am going to create an empty line here and I am going to add to this 
this value plus some space. And at the end of this, I'm going to print the line. Okay. And then we can see how that works because I am going to call this like this. Okay. Does that look reasonable? So do you want the, all the bells and whistles? So you can say, okay, I'm going to put after every third line, I'm going to put a line. And after every third uh, column, I'm going to put a uh, thing here. So what I can do is I can say if j mod 3 is equal to 2. I know that I've explained this like many times during my stars. That's why I now know this by heart. Um, it will be something like this. And I also need to put one first. Okay. So I need a space right here. And I need a space after this one. Okay. Looking all right. Now I need to put a uh, header and bottom at the, in the very bottom. So it is going to be how many characters? 9, 27, 31, I believe. And in fact, the same thing is true here. Looks a little long to me. Uh, so nine times three is 27. All right, so now what I'm going to do is uh, great programming by trial and error. So. Close enough. I think I need two more. I think this is working very well for me. All right. All right, good. So, um, okay, so now these are kind of the simple parts. So now the next thing I need to do is find uh, what value is missing from a given location, which is more interesting, right? So now can I find all possible values for a cell? What are all the possible values for a cell? All the numbers from 1 to 9, right? So I can find all possible. You can write this here, or I can write a function. That's, uh, I only need to do this once, but I'm going to do it like this. So I am going to now create a set. And for i in range 9, I am going to add to the set the string version of i, because I don't want to actually test anything. So one of the things you can do when you are testing code, you can just cut and paste your function here if you want to just test that function. This function doesn't require any extra variables, so you can actually just test it like this. Okay. And then I need to see a mistake, which is What is it that I'm doing wrong here? Can you have zero in the Sudoku board? No, you can have one to nine, right? So I actually need to use a better range. So like one to 10. Okay, let's try again. <coughs> and you see it's not ordered, right? You can see that it's not ordered not by uh, numerical ordering at least. If you wanted to actually make this into a list, that's also not ordered, right? This was an earlier question, that when you make into a list, it is not ordered unless you actually do sort it. Okay. Now this is ordered, this is the lexicographic ordering. Okay. So, So now I am going to find uh, missing values from a single cell. So I'm given a cell like, like this one, 
I want to find what values are possible here. So I can see, for example, I have 8, 2, 9, 3, and 7 here. I have 5 and 4 here, and 4, 8, 6 here. So I need to take all of those values that I find from that location, subtract that from the set of all possible values. And that's what the values are missing from my Sudoku board. Okay? So now, yes, you hate it, but I'm going to do it. So I am going to write a function that takes a board, a row and a column, and I'm going to send it my list of possible values so I can reuse the set multiple times. And I'm going to find what values are found. So I'm going to have a found set. These are a set of values in this row, column, and grid. Right. So I am going to write the simple value. to the set. I don't even care if I repeat the same value because the set is going to remove all duplicates. Next, I'd have to do the 3 by 3, the thing that you hate the most, yes? Okay. I have to find out which of these grid areas I am in. So I am going to basically refer to this grid as uh, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. So this is grid 1, 1. This is grid 0, 1. So I'm going to find which grid I am in by taking row divided by 3 and column divided by 3. <laughs> so I am going to now do the following. So I'm going to go through a 3 by 3 grid. So these are all the values that I find in the row, column, or 3 by 3. I put them in a set. Now I'm going to return you what is missing. So what is missing is all possible values. Subtract from that all the values that you found. So you can test this. If you want to write, now the first thing I will do is I will write code to test this before I do more things. So the, the way that I can test this is to read a row and column from you and then find what it is returned and then print it. So I am going to take row input. And I'm going to print whatever this finds from my board, row, and column. And the pass that I found here. Okay. So this is kind of the principle of uh, iterative programming, right? So I do, I add something, and then I test it. In fact, when I wrote this last night, I tested this for one hour. Eventually, I realized my program was right, but the board was actually not solvable using this algorithm, right? So, you know, we all have our problems. All right. So let's try a row and a column, and then we are going to um, finish this off. So I want to see, for example, what values are possible in this row and column. So this is row one. I have not converted to human row. And then this is column 
0, 1, right? So can you tell me what is missing from here? So 4, 8, and 6 are not missing. 5 is not missing. 2 is not missing. 3 is not missing. 7 is not missing. Is it only 1? Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, and 6, right? Oh, no, 6 is here. What else is missing? So let's try another one. Let's try this one here. So this is row seven and column two, right? So it can only be two, four, or six. Two, four, and six, right? Okay, are we convinced? You can test a few more times. All right, I'll, I'll test one more, and then we will go. I'm only picking the ones that are easy, but that there is no proof. So we have one, two, three, uh, six, and nine. So three is here, six is here. So that could only be nine. So this is row zero, and there we go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep adding. Uh, I'm going to keep finding the first place that has only one possible value. Put that value in there and keep computing. Okay? So this seems like an infinite loop, which I don't love. So generally what I do write is I write some sort of a um, while loop here that I know for sure will end. So, so I'm going to put a finished some Boolean and I'm going to say while not finished. And I'm going to actually uh, put a while loop here that I know for sure will finish. So for example, I'm going to actually read the raw input. Okay. So you see, this is this loop doesn't really do anything, but I want to make sure that my uh, program actually ends before I do anything else. So at least when I enter stop, it finishes, so which is good. Okay. So if it is not finished, um, I am going to find a slot. given the board and all possible values, okay? So let's see what that function would be like. So this, this point cell is going to go through every cell in the um, function, in the board. So go through every cell for i in range nine or j in range nine. I only need to go through cells that are empty, right? So if board ij is equal to empty, then um, find what value is missing from this area. So it's board ij possible, right? If length of missing is equal to one, then I'm going to return i and j. Okay. If you want to also return what value is missing, because there's only one I know, we, we need to do a little bit different thing because yeah, I have to actually convert this to a list so that I can return you what is at zero. And what will happen if my function returns nothing? What value it will return? it will return none. If you don't want to return none, you can return something like this, just so that I have mental awareness of what my function is doing. Okay, so I am going to get some value. If there is no more value, i is going to be if I don't find a position in the cell, i is going to be 
none, right? If this uh, bothers you, you can also do a negative one. Just you know that there is no negative one, but this is not generally a good way to solve this because you know that you know negative one is also a valid index in a list. But you can do it this way too. Whatever is right for you that you know that you went through every cell and you could not find anything, you can return something else. You can return negative one, you can return none. It is up to you. So if i is equal to none, then finished is true. Else, I have found something. So I am going to then put that value in the board. And then I am going to actually tell you what I have done. And then I'm going to print the board again so you can see what I have done. And continue. Okay. The point is that, you know, while I'm not finished, I will keep finding a place, putting the value, showing you what I've done, and then continue. Because the next time I repeat, it's going to come to here. Now I want to show you that this is what I mean. This is the main thing my program does, right? And it's fairly short, right? You can kind of read what it does. You can see. And then everything that is kind of complex, I put it in a function. But each of my functions do one thing. Like finding a location was too complex, so I divided into first finding missing values for a cell, and then looking at every cell. Because otherwise it would have been a massive function. So let me just test this before we finish, because people are going to go. Okay. Now I don't know if this is correct, but hopefully it is. Okay. So if I cannot do this, ah, uh, person D, person D, person D, because the value is actually a string. All right, let's see. All right, there we go. So I put 7 in 0, 2, because that was the first place where it was not. And if you want it to be like human readable, you can actually now do a little bit more, because, you know, people don't understand row and column as starting from 0. You can actually add 1. So now it is human readable, so you can do it like this. Okay, so I put 7 in 1, 3, uh, 5 in 1, 4, 6 in 1, 6, and it keeps filling it up. Oh, there's one left. Now, the interesting question, is it going to uh, stop or not, right? This is your acid test. This is why I put the raw input, because you never know. It's not like I'm invisible or anything. Yes. All right. So um, this is kind of uh, the, the type of programming I want you to start practicing as we get more and more advanced, just to look at everything with simple pieces of code and then build your program in as much as possible. I am not going to post this online because I want you to be able to write this on your own. But I will put the course, I will put the video online. 